come and join us up on stage. And I'm next. Yep. Okay, hey, welcome, welcome to this session. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, the circular economy, so basically how to make the most out of the stuff we already have. Um, and, uh, and with us today, we have a, a very distinguished panel. Uh, we have uh, Rick Ridgway, who is from Patagonia, which is a, a company at the forefront of what has come to be known as a circular economy. He's the uh, vice president of environmental affairs for the clothes maker. Uh, we have Peter Lacey from Accenture. Uh, he is the Global Managing Director for Sustainability Services, and uh, he knows, you know, possibly more than most people in the world about, about the circular economy. And we have Michael Molito, who is currently the chairman of an exciting uh, Swedish-Australian uh, electric car company called Unity. And I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about, about that in a moment. But previously, he was also a, uh, a, a world-leading consultant on, on climate change for some of the world's uh, biggest uh, consultancies. Now, I would like to begin by uh, letting each of them set out their circular stalls. Um, and then we'll take the discussion on from there. Rick, why don't we start with you? <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Jan. Well, first, an overview of our company. Uh, most importantly, we're privately held. As uh, our founder, Yvonne Chouinard, says, that, gets to me, that means we get to do whatever we want. And what we want to do is use our company as a tool for environmental protection. We're not in business to make our shareholders wealthy. They live pretty simply. We make all of our decisions long and short term following our mission, which is our value proposition to make the best product we possibly can. The most durable product uh, is also the product with the lowest environmental footprint. We make that product causing no unnecessary harm, both in our operations and through the supply chain. And finally, we use the success of our business to give back, to implement solutions to the environmental crisis. We have a super robust philanthropy in North America. We're the biggest environmental grant-making organization and by number of grants that we make uh, than any uh, foundation or NGO in the continent. Uh, so that's uh, the overview. That's why we're in business. Excellent. Peter, what do you do for a living? <laughs> Accenture believes that circular economy is a four and a half trillion dollar global opportunity over the next 10 years for companies to produce the products and services that allow customers and consumers to derive the value that they need but decoupled from scarce and harmful natural resource use and at the heart of what we're trying to do at Accenture uh, at using our core business is to provide strategy advice, technology solutions to help clients unlock the potential of the circular economy. For us, the circular economy is an innovation concept. It's a way of thinking about how you engage with customers, with consumers, with new business models on the one hand, recovery and recycle models, extended life cycle models, sharing economy, shifting from products to services, the next generation of circular supply chains. How on the one hand you deploy that with the extraordinary array of new technologies emerging in the fourth industrial revolution. Many examples of which we see here today uh, in the web summit and how you combine those to create an opportunity not just to drive real sustainability impact, but to drive competitive advantage. So, Michael, your, your previous employers, PricewaterhouseCoopers, McKinsey, um, they're probably sort of almost household names uh, for many people here. Unity is not. Can you tell us a little bit about the, sort of this cryptic company? Yes, hi, welcome everyone. I'm Michael Molter, I'm the chairman of, of, of Unity. We're a Swedish Australian autonomous electric vehicle company built on completely circular principles. Right, so we target the single largest auto trips segment on the planet, right? 93.8% of all vehicle trips on the planet are urban, suburban, 1.2 people in the vehicle, less than 30 kilometers, less than 20, 22 miles, right? Average maximum speed of 60 kilometers, right? So if you're going to optimize for that, you start from a completely clean slate, right? right? 
That means we use bioplastic, we use injection molding, and we have about 200 parts in the vehicle total, where your car has about 3,000 parts. And everything in the vehicle, from the precursors for the resins, for the carbon fiber, to the bioplastics, we recycle, our goal is to recycle every single molecule, right, including the tires. Right? And we don't do that because we wake up and we want to be green. Green is important. We believe the market's going to move and we'll value that. This will be the ultimate driver of growth. Right? Okay, so, so uh, Peter, I, will, I want to start with you. I, I just want to, to, circular economy is a word, is a term that's been bandied about a lot in the past few years. I want to understand exactly what's circular about the circular economy. I think... It, the, the idea of circular economy is this, so it works at two levels, right? If, if you really look at it at the macro and the micro level, at the macro level, circular economy is about shifting away from value chains that we've put in place over the last 200 years since the Industrial Revolution, the first Industrial Revolution, which were based on the principles of infinite abundance of natural resources to power our global economy. And these were linear value chains. Just to oversimplify, it was about take, make, throw away, and waste. And the circular economy is about thinking how we redefine the relationship between the economy, between the products and services we want, with those scarce or harmful natural resources, so we move to a take, make, take, make, take, make world and society. And if you start from that perspective, and you start from that as an innovation concept, then the challenge is for you, whether it's a, a company working on automotive or mobility solutions, to start with that in mind, deliver for customers, deliver for consumers, but decouple the scarce or harmful use of natural resources. And I think you know, one of the reasons we're excited as Accenture to be here supporting Planet Tech, supporting some of the innovators who are out here, some of the, the folks who've won scholarships is, we think that is a fantastic canvas for this group of extraordinary innovators and entrepreneurs at the Web Summit to orient their solutions to either challenge and disrupt large companies or to work with and partner and scale some of those solutions that will require this extraordinary wave of technology and innovation. So, Michael, I have a question for you uh, about so to what extent can we because it's all well and good to say to reuse things, but reusing things also requires the input of certain resources, right? You don't you just take something that has been made into a, a plastic box and turn it into a tire without expending other resources. So in, in, in Unity, do you take the sort of this, this whole sort of life cycle, as it were, costs of um, you know, resource uh, use into consideration when you, when, you do your, when you do your circular calculus? Yeah, so part of our design, part of our circular design is to make sure that our suppliers, we bring our suppliers, our key suppliers to us, right? So we are um, working with a company that in Australia is gonna build a gigafactory and we'll end up taking up 100% of that production, right? So we, we don't wanna ship graphite from Tanzania. Uh, we wanna use graphite from South Australia. You know, Australia is the largest ex exporter of lithium, right? Um, so we, we pick Sweden and we pick Australia for very, very important reasons. It allows us to build a circular model, not only in terms of our own operations, but in terms of our entire supply chain, going all the way back to the raw materials. I mean, believe it or not, the guy, Peter Carlson, who, who, who built Tesla's Gigafactory, he's building the second Gigafactory at the top of Sweden, right? Because they have surplus hydroelectricity up there and they have the basic raw materials. That's the right model. Yeah, so um, Patagonia has been in the circular business for, for longer than most companies. And you, 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 it was one of the companies which have pioneered this, uh, this approach. Um, it certainly latched onto it very early. Um, so uh, is it now harder to sort of, to, do you now feel that you have to take into consideration more of these factors, more of these sort of previously external variables into your internal calculations? Well, yes, we, we do, but it's actually less barrier and more opportunity. We, as you just said, we started off uh, a long time ago in the early 2000s uh, when the circular economy first entered the lexicon, <clears throat> thinking back then that it was about developing products that could be uh, captured into a closed loop where the initial material inputs uh, could be returned uh, into new products. And, and we worked with our vendors to achieve that. In the case of our polyester clothes, 
uh, we developed uh, um, next to skin uh, underwear and uh, the insulated garments that when they're completely worn out and returned by our customers, could be returned to our vendors who took the worn out uh, apparel products and chemically recycled them into uh, new polyester fiber, molecularly identical to the virgin fiber, and we made new clothes out of them. That's, that's a closed loop. But since then, we've come internally to define a closed loop more like Peter just described it to all of you. And in thinking about how to widen the definition of, closed, of circular economy, we came up with a new partnership with our customers. You know, and they own half the environmental impact of one of our products over its lifetime, sometimes even more. So we have this partnership called Warmwear, and we encourage our customers to bring the products back when they're broken but still serviceable. We fix them uh, in our uh, central repair facility, the biggest in the world right now, uh, or our uh, stores repair them for our customers. They keep them in circulation. Uh, if they're not using them anymore, they can bring them back to us. We'll give them store credit. We take those used goods, we restore them, and now we're in the used clothing business. We resell them. If they're completely worn out, bring them back to us and we'll recycle them. So those are the three R's of uh, how we define the circular economy. But there's a fourth one that is by far the most controversial, and uh, that is reduce. We encourage our customers not to buy our stuff <laughs> unless they really need it. And to get that kind of bizarre conversation kick-started, we a few years ago ran that ad in the New York Times full page on Black Friday, kicking off the Christmas shopping frenzy with a large illustration of our best-selling jacket and the bold headline, don't buy this jacket. We wanted to shock people because we wanted to read the copy. Did people buy more after that ad? Yeah, they did, and I'll get to that in a minute. In fact, Advertising Age call it the, the most clever use of reverse psychology in the history of advertising. And they didn't get it. They didn't understand we were serious about what we said in the copy, that no matter how hard we made that jacket causing no unnecessary harm, guess what? It released 135 pounds of CO2. It had used 20 gallons of water. It had left behind two-thirds of its own weight and waste. We couldn't get the footprint down any lower than that. So we believe long term that we're going to have to do something about this topic of consumption. We believe we have a business model that's robust for the future, but we also believe that that future is not going to work for any of us if the amount of goods and services that a growing world population is using doesn't go down. Yeah. What's business going to look like when that happens? That, that, that's exactly the question I'll now pose to Peter. But no, um, the, it, the thing about Patagonia, which I love, I mean, I, I have to confess, I'm a Patagonia user. Um, um, and... Uh, the thing about Patagonia is that, in effect, it's a luxury brand. It's not a, you know, it, it, their stuff is very, very good, very durable, and also quite expensive in the grand scheme of things. Not everybody can go off to, uh, and buy a $100 pair of pants, because that's sort of, on average, what they will cost. Even if they last 20 years? Well, no, I mean, to splurge $100 at a, you know, people have different amounts of disposable incomes. You know, some can't afford to spend $100 at a go. I'm sure that, you know, viewed as an investment, um, and for those who can invest, who can afford to invest, um, that's certainly an option. But it, so in effect, you know, you could classify Patagonia as a, as a, as a luxury brand, um, but not every brand, almost by definition, can be a luxury brand because luxury is also about status, and status uh, goods are positional goods. You know, you can't, not every brand can be can be a luxury brand. So, Peter, is this model scalable uh, beyond? broadly construed luxury markets? I think it's a lot more scalable um, than, than I think a lot of folks. Hang oh, there, there we go. go. My microphone. Um, I think it's a lot more scalable than many companies realize if you step back and think about first principles. I'm also a user of Patagonia. I think it's been a fantastic um, setter of, of standards in the industry in footwear and apparel. And in fact, last year at the World Economic Forum in a set of events that, that I curated with the WEF, we actually awarded Patagonia as the, as the winner of the Global Circular Economy Prize. So it's a fantastic example. But it's a really good question. How do you get that into the mainstream? How do you get that into businesses where maybe rather than brand affinity or loyalty or the higher end of kind of luxury brands, when it's not that, but it's about 
about a cost proposition, where it's about perhaps a product or a service that has a low attachment, just an everyday consumer good. I think each category, each industry, each company needs to go back to basics and look at how circular can drive out cost in terms of wasted use of natural resources. You know, when we're using energy or water or materials inefficiently, unproductively, that adds to the cost of goods sold for companies. Actually reevaluating that and actually being more efficient, more sustainable, allows companies to look at the cost base differently. I also think that when you start to look more carefully at the value that you deliver for a customer and think carefully from first principles why you have such heavy embedded natural resources in that business model, it's a way of going back to basics and doing that. For example, in the mobility space. You know, it clearly cannot make any sense, as you rightly pointed out, to have a mobility system that is set up that currently functions on the basis of 1.2 drivers in each car in a situation where 98% of the time your car sits on your driveway. I lived, I lived in Sao Paulo for four years. Right. So you, I'm seen, all too familiar with that. You've seen the downside. Predicament. <laughs> but like, I think that's, you know, we actually end up, our calculation is in the mobility industry. So it's good to see Michael and others disrupting that. You know, that, that actually the industry as a whole, private vehicles are operating at probably between 1% and 2% efficiency. Right? If you think of the embedded energy, the embedded materials, the embedded, not just in terms of the capital costs of the actual physical equipment, but then the running costs, then to your point, the drag that has on productivity in cities, cities like Sao Paulo because they're congested. And you just look and say, this doesn't make any sense. So coming back to the point about mainstream companies, there are plenty of opportunities to attack the revenue line and the cost line through the radical shift of circular economy. Michael, do you think that in order to achieve this, uh, this marvelous circular future, uh, do we need to be more careful about or more uh, demanding about pricing the externalities which are currently not priced? The, 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 sort of the, the social, environmental and other effects uh, that are just not, they're not uh, contained in the price of the goods and services that we currently use? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in our model, we don't need to bring in our, those externalities. I mean, the externalities are enormous, so there's no question. The environmental externalities are enormous, the social uh, externalities are enormous. Congestion, uh, increase in childhood asthma in large cities, those things are huge and they're growing and they're horrific. But, but in, in our model, look, what, look at the model we have now. Right? And, and, and Peter was pointing to this. If you buy an internal combustion vehicle today, you're using it 5% of the time. As Peter pointed out, its conversion efficiency is about 1%. It's rapidly depreciating in value, and it's the second most expensive thing that you buy, right? Now, those aren't the externalities. Those are the internalities, right? So our model is based on people consuming less, right? We can move the same number of people in Paris, France, right, with one fiftieth the vehicles, right? So our model depends on taking you today from about 65 euro cents per kilometer to two cents per kilometer, right? Right? Because the economic inefficiencies without the externalities are absolutely massive. And we tell governments after exploding healthcare costs, the single most expensive drain on growth is transport and, and, and mobility and keeping this model going. So we would love to do everything possible to see those externalities captured. They certainly add to our value, but that's not our model. Our model is to attack the inefficiencies that exist, right? I mean, Uber's worth 69 billion, and they captured two of the 15 inefficiencies that we've identified. P Peter, I have, a, I have a question for you. To what extent is this sort of globally scalable? The problem is that, as you know, with the very clever ad was to buy less of our stuff, but if all companies around the world did this, wouldn't we face like mass unemployment, social unrest, you know, revolutions the world over? Uh, so I think, I mean, that's a reasonable question to ask, and I don't think anyone yet has all of the answers to that question. So I think, you know, so those folks who sort of automatically dismiss it and say, no, we'll create new jobs, new industries, etc., uh, without the facts and figures, I don't think that's helpful. On the other side, you know, I think it's reasonable to look at the other periods, the other three industrial revolutions and say, actually, there was a lag effect, but we did create new industries, new jobs, and we did find ways. Now, no, but, we, but we're still using those linear models at the time. We're still using the linear model that we were, that you outlined at the start of our conversation. So what, 
I, I think you're, it's a, there is a qualitative difference here. I think the key, the key concept for me is the shift from products and services and the dematerialization shift. So this is not, circular economy is not a concept that is against markets or against, um, even against consumption. Right? This is not a, an anti-capitalism, anti-business agenda. This is a way of saying, look, if we're going to create a global economy that's capable of sustaining this, we need to find ways of decoupling those scarce and harmful natural resources. I thought where you were going to go, and I think it is worth going there, in, in your last question is, uh, so the model that Michael describes you know, actually works here and now. The model that we've heard from Patagonia works here and now. There are other models in other industries where we do need regulatory intervention, where we do need, um, you know, we do need externalities internalized in markets in terms of pricing, where actually the market does not clear at the moment. And to your point about global scale, it's going to be an agenda of both. On the one hand, you need real innovators showing how to come up with models that disrupt the status quo and are far more uh, circular. On the other hand, we are going to need to get smarter at measuring what we really want in the outcome of economies, disrupting the idea of GDP, coming in with pricing signals and so on to get this. I mean, the 4.2 trillion that we talked about, I talked about in the opening, we believe that is an opportunity that does not depend on any regulatory or policy initiative out to 2030. So that's a real opportunity here now. Now you price carbon into that, or you extend producer responsibility for the take back and flow of materials, and it could be orders of magnitude more than that in terms of the opportunity. Uh, Rick, does Patagonia sell more today than it did 10 years ago? It does, yeah, and we're growing, and like I've heard many times in the uh, lectures I've attended here today, uh, other people saying, uh, if we have a business model uh, that delivers sustainability, well, as we grow, so do our solutions, and, and, and we believe that. But we also believe that uh, a circular economy alone is not going to prevent us from going over the cliff. But without uh, scaling a circular economy, uh, we're uh, not going to be able to avoid that cliff either. Uh, not only with a circular economy, we have to scale all sustainability innovations. But as I said a minute ago, we believe that even all those combined aren't enough to avoid the cliff if we don't confront this elephant in the room around uh, annual compounded growth, a.k.a. consumption, on a population going from 7 to 10 billion. But we can figure this out. Uh, as Peter just said, part of it is that shift from, ser from goods to services. That is a fraction of it. And as you suggested, Jan, it's going to ultimately require all of us to redefine what work means in our lives. And on that note, unfortunately, we have to end. I'd like to thank the panelists, Rick, Peter, Michael. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks, Jan. Thanks very much.